Thank you for attending this short talk about metadata. This is going to be a pretty quick introduction about what metadata is and why it deserves time and consideration. So over the next few minutes, these are the things I'll be talking about. What is metadata? Defining the term. Why is it important? We often get asked why metadata matters or why so much metadata matters. So I'll talk briefly about that. Types of metadata breaking it down into various categories, and enhancing metadata. That's seeing metadata as an evolving process as knowledge builds and interpretations and narratives change, but also as use cases and methods of generating metadata change. If someone is finding it hard to find or use your data, often it's because metadata is the missing part of the puzzle. But what does metadata even mean? You might have seen metadata defined as data about data which is catchy, but not very helpful, and is also a bit off-putting to people who are new to or intimidated by technical language. But all metadata is, is documentation, or even just information. It just happens to be in digital form, describing digital things. Digital documentation about your digital resource. It's your photo registers, your database's dictionary or relationship diagram, or just written information about your project or creation process. It's the part of the archive that provides context and meaning. Which is why metadata is so important. At a very basic level, a description of your data can unlock what it is and how it can be reused. But it can be the means by which users can understand where your data came from, why it was created in the first place, and whether it is of any future use to them. It provides the context for its initial and continued existence, and fills in the gaps of information that the data by itself cannot fill. Much like this image of a random can cannot be used without its label. Without the label's information, the consumer does not know if the can contains something consumable, or potentially paint or poison, or something else entirely. Should they know it contains a food item, how are they to know if it's still safe to eat, or years old, or whether or not it contains something they may be allergic to? Is it suitable for children? Who is its target audience? Aside from how usable it is, this CAN comparison also illustrates that metadata can be used for marketing. There is a business case for surfacing different types of resources at different times, or at different levels of visibility in your archive. We all do this. The Archaeology Data Service shows featured images on their homepage. This cannot be done without metadata. And going back to the CAN image, a consumer is much more likely to pick up a CAN with information and a snappy self-explanatory title the mystery can will always be left on the shelf. So okay, metadata is important, but we often get asked, why is so much metadata important? Well, metadata comes in different forms and is used for several different purposes, which I'll go through in a minute. But also, effective metadata is primarily created to enable access and reuse, but this means different things to different people. Languages, subject knowledge, technical ability, and physical and mental abilities differ from user to user, and good metadata needs to cater for as broad an audience as possible. This needs to include not just the people who will potentially reuse the data, but also those who manage and curate it. Different repositories and metadata professionals have different ways of grouping the types of information that the term metadata covers, but for the purposes of this talk, I've used three of the more common categories administrative, structural, and descriptive. You might also come across subcategories such as provenance and preservation, but broadly speaking, the information required to manage, understand, and provide access to the data falls under these three headings. Administrative metadata covers all of the information required to manage your resource for continued access. It is about managing and recording the process a digital object goes through throughout its life cycle from planning for its creation through to hopefully its continued and ongoing reuse. It is the information necessary both for trust in the data and also to provide for its ongoing preservation. Administrative metadata often captures the context necessary to understand digital resources such as the creation and or acquisition of the data, rights management and deposition within an archive. In terms of archaeology or heritage, a key part of administrative metadata is describing provenance. 
information about the project, research or investigation that led to the creation of the digital resource, including who was involved in the project and therefore the resource's creation, and who holds copyright, as well as who, if anyone, peer-reviewed the final outputs. There is also, for site-based work especially, the description of where the project took place. When it happened, is it likely to have been superseded by later investigations? What happened? The method that led to the data creation? And also why? What were the drivers for the research or investigation? And why were some data retained and other data discarded? The why can be vitally important in assessing a resource's trustworthiness. In those whys, we can understand any limitations of the data, as well as any inherent bias or reasons for one interpretation of the primary data over another. Administrative metadata also comprises both technical and preservation metadata, and may include information about rights and reproduction or other access requirements, audit trails or logs created by a management system, and persistent identifiers. Structural metadata describes the organisation of an archive's digital objects and the relationships between them. It shows whether an object is part of a wider collection or group of collections, what journal volumes may form a series, for example, or which articles form a volume, and articles page numbers even, so that the ordering of articles within a volume can be retained. It means that no object is orphaned or without the wider context of its related objects. The structural metadata can show the original order of an archive. It may be that several phases of work are done on one site, but structural metadata can describe which objects were deposited together and therefore connects the digital results of different phases of work as well as different phases of deposition. Importantly, structural metadata also links the digital resource to any related documentation as well as any related collections within or without the repository in which it resides. It can show the relationship between the digital object and the event that created it or further resources that were created years after by future researchers, linking the original resource to its later reuse, which is important for demonstrating the impact of that resource. So with administrative metadata, we know where the resource came from, how it was made and how to manage it. With structural metadata, we may know it came from a collection of objects as part of a single deposition from a single event, and we can find related documentation. But what is it? Descriptive metadata can be the tricky one, especially for archivists or those trying to describe the data later. The longer the gap between the creation of an object and the longer the chain of people involved between the creator and the final point of access, the harder it is to describe. Descriptive metadata may also be subjective, where the content or narrative is dependent on interpretation. Regardless, it is the key metadata type for resource discovery, as it describes the content of a resource and it's what most often connects the user to the objects they are interested in. It is what subject-based searchers use to find data, the theme, the topic, the type of content. And while a picture may paint a thousand words, sometimes those words may not be the correct ones, or may be invisible to anyone less familiar with the subject matter, the format, or those who are not capable of seeing visual media at all. It may be that at first, the basic title or caption is the sole point of reference for some users. How we use descriptive metadata can be broken down by answering four basic questions based around what, where, who and when. What type of resource is it and what is it about? Is the resource about a specific place? Where is that place? Is the resource about a specific person? What do you know about that person? What time period does the resource cover? Will it be of interest to users researching a particular historic period or event? So starting with what is it? At the very basic level, there should be an informative title explaining what the resource is and what its content is. So again, especially for those who cannot recognize or access your visual media, including those who may rely on screen readers for their information, this should be a short textual caption, which can be expanded upon with a separate description. These images are all of trenches, but actually there's nothing in this illustration that describes them as images, or even that there's five of them, or that they are photographs. To anyone who cannot view the photographs, they could be sketches, maps, or simply a list reading trench one, trench two, trench three, etc. 
to anyone unfamiliar with the wider context that these images are the result of modern archaeological fieldwork, for all anyone knows they refer to military or defensive trenches. So here we have a good illustration of the title of this presentation, The Importance of Being Explicit, and how this helps to provide access to people who may have physical or technological limitations that make thumbnails or online images impossible to view, ensuring fair and wider reach to potential users. A simple description such as the one now shown makes all the difference and removes the idea that this data is only for people who are already in the know. If the subject matter of the resource you are describing is about a specific location or is location based, then it is important to add that to any description. As I mentioned with the five trenches, without context, those trenches could be interpreted as building, military or defensive. And to anyone except the creators, those trenches could have been located anywhere. In that case, for example, Trench 1 was located in East Street, Olney, Milton Keynes, England, UK. The creation location and the location as a subject of the photo itself were the same. But that is not always the case. Specialist research might be undertaken at a university laboratory, for example, and all of the data created in the lab but the research might be analysing items originating from an entirely different continent, or it might be that a thesis written in the UK might be entirely to do with migration in continental Africa, for example. So the location as a descriptive metadata item should be treated as distinct from the location showing where the resource was created. Being explicit in these different cases makes it easier for the user to be aware of the difference between the place of origin of the primary material and the location and possibly culture that interprets it. Place names are not self-evident. While the archivist may think of a site as world famous, many people may have heard of Stonehenge, for example, the image of that site and the name and location may be unfamiliar or known slightly differently to users around the world. Place names are not unique. Olney in Buckinghamshire, England, the site of one of those trench images, is only one of several Olneys in the world, there are at least 12 more in the United States. Place names come and go. Countries' borders shift. Places are renamed. Counties and states redefined. Sites and buildings demolished or destroyed. So the metadata should acknowledge if a place name is current, true at the point of data creation, or referring to a historical place. Then there are the places that never existed except in myth or fiction but still form the subject of a resource when depicted on artefacts or in texts. A stone carving depicting Valhalla or Asgard from Norse mythology would be an example of this. Where a resource is about a particular person or figure, it is important that users can find it based on their name or common identification. Things to consider when describing people for users are alternative names or titles, is a historical figure known by different names by different researchers, Roman Emperor Constantine I, shown here on a coin in the top right, was also known as Constantine the Great, or the object itself might refer to him by his Latin name, Flavius Valerius Constantinus. It might be worth distinguishing between people who are contemporary to the resource, a known person, a historical figure, or a mythological one. Depending on the reuse, defining this ensures that search results are transparent or distinct. If the person is still living, it may be that there are privacy issues, or simply specific names or titles by which they wish to be known or referred to in different contexts, and that might change should their name or titles change. Would your users be likely to want some background information? Is a name not enough? If so, tied to the person's name, you might need to document key facts about their life, story, or reason for their identification or presence in your data or archive. The black and white photograph in the bottom left image depicts archaeologist Alan Vince, and together with his data, the collection describes who he was and what his area of research was. If a user comes to an archive looking for 15th century shipwrecks, then the only way they can find that is if the descriptive metadata is there to highlight it. As with location, the description of time when it comes to subject matter is distinct from the point in time when the resource was created. This is also true of digitised materials, a 21st century scan of a 16th century letter, for example. A letter's contents might also discuss an earlier or future period or date, 
so your descriptive metadata may need to have room for both the time period as discussed in the letter and the time period the digitised letter was written. Perhaps something to consider is that often in archaeology the interpretation of the time period from which a feature or artefact originates is uncertain or subject to change as scientific methods of dating evolve. The description of an item's period of origin is therefore not necessarily fixed and is an example of how a metadata record is a living record, not a static one. Metadata is powerful. You can use it to interrogate and present your data in different ways. But semantic metadata is even more powerful. Incorporating semantic technology, defining meaning and connections, allows you to tap into metadata that is rich with meaning and context, and that is connected to thousands of other datasets. Again, in terms of building trust in your data, it is important for users to know why you might have chosen to describe a digital object in a specific way. Are you following a set of standards? While I mentioned that our administrative metadata can be useful to establish trust in the quality of the data itself, it is important that our users and future digital archivists can trust the metadata we use to describe it. Following a set of standards can be useful to create consistency in the format of your metadata, but it is also important, especially for machines, to be able to understand your metadata, that the terms and types of values you use in your descriptions are consistent. For both machine and human understanding, it is essential that the terms you used are also explicitly defined, whether internally in your own metadata or externally through the use of established vocabularies. One person's definition of the Iron Age, for example, is not the same as another's. So if you use that term, your audience should be able to find out what you mean by it. By defining meaning and standards, you enable your data to become connected to any and all related data resources, either on a human level by allowing users and archivists to see how your data may relate to others through common description, or on a hugely vast technological level by allowing your metadata to be machine readable and understandable, and therefore connectable to similar metadata across the world and across disciplines. All of these things can be achieved by mapping your metadata to standards and vocabularies. But mapping is also important for sharing at a more basic level. You can share your metadata with a much wider group of users by mapping your metadata fields to those of different institutions and repositories, creating extended catalogues such as those seen in the UK's National Archives or in the Ariadne portal. This all widens your reach, gives you a much larger potential user community and increases the value of your data. Obviously, as specialists in digital preservation, we focus on keeping the data itself safe and accessible. But just to leave you with a thought on metadata as a lasting record, taken from recent events. If disaster struck and the digital resources themselves needed to be taken offline, or were somehow no longer available, what story would your metadata tell? What gaps could it fill? Would there be a record at all? Thank you.